And we're back. <laughs> we are back. How's it going, Serena? Good, good. So we are already streaming. And I just put up the note that we'll get started at the top of the hour. Sounds good. I'm thinking about I'm just thinking about the the magic answer to all questions is <laughs> the <a> secret. <laughs> yep, it's a secret. We can't tell. <laughs> I do like this royalty-free playlist, though. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> I like it. I was actually playing around in Restream earlier. It's the software I use to... So, you know, we're on Zoom, and then it goes out to YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook. And that's all handled by Restream. And you can actually set it to play a playlist mm -hmm. for you so that, you know, if you were trying to broadcast, but, you know, you didn't want to do it where you were live, you can do that and you can have a whole you know a whole dance party yeah. <laughs> ready to Super go for cool. you. yeah that's a good playlist yeah i think the last one was a, a totally different kind of music for the last one we did right well it's the same playlist it's just uh further along yeah super cool a mix of things right yep It's very relaxing. <laughs> yeah, I like relaxing. Yep, me too. So just a little inside baseball for everybody who's tuning in early. You know, we had a uh, call with a new client earlier today. And, you know, I asked them how they heard about us. And they said, oh, you know, somebody told me about you. Then I checked out one of your webinars and... So that's uh, that's the idea that people can get, you know, actually good information, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. as opposed to all the bad information that's out there. Yep. I was mm -hmm. in one of my uh, one of my mastermind groups. Uh, they were talking about doing uh, paid Q and A's, and I was like, yeah, you know, I like doing these freebies. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, so we have the monthly navigator group, which is a paid group. It's super cheap, but it is a paid group. And that's more in-depth, in detail. And we have our monthly calls and everything. But um, this is more general. So, uh, you know, we're not going to get into, like, somebody's specific individual tax situation. Because that's private information. But, uh, you know, we'll go over generalities on these. And I think that's appropriate for, you know, the, the wide audience. And I want as many people to to have as good information as possible. Yep. We are not afraid to give out free information. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, so at the top of the hour, we'll, we'll get into, before we get into the Q&A, there's another thing that's been on my mind that we want to get into about what the real tax rates actually are. And uh, I've been doing a little bit of math. It's a little bit, uh, what's the word? Uh, terrifying? No. Uh, it's a little bit more than you think. Let's put it that way. Because the numbers on the page do not actually tell you the full story. And I've only had this realization recently. We'll get into all that here. We got 28 seconds. I can delete this note here. All right.
All right, so it is 6 p.m., at least where I am. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Today is February 27th, 2024. It's a Tuesday, which means it's time for Tax Sherpa Live here. And this week we're doing office hours. And next week we're doing office hours as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because uh, it's a busy time for us. So, you know, taking the time to create whole new presentations is, a, uh, is difficult during this part of the year. But uh, I am your host, Neil McSpadden, and with me is Serena, our ops manager. She's the one who basically keeps all the wheels running and the trains on time and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are Tax Sherpa, I and mean, there's others on the team, but uh, those are the two of us that are here tonight. And what we do is we will file your taxes, sure. Uh, lots of people will file your taxes, but our our unique thing and the thing that makes us different is that we will actually plan with you along the way to make sure that you are optimized as best as possible to save yourself tens of thousands of dollars on your income taxes. Um, the highest uh, I've ever saved a client is six million bucks, but that was uh, obviously most people aren't in those numbers, but uh, that is my current personal best. <laughs> pretty, so, good. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, so we'll we'll get into uh, how everything works here in just a second. But let's let's go on to the next page here. So this is me. This is my story. It's my big face there. And I'll, I'm going to tell you a short story uh, about my own personal journey. So I actually majored in engineering in college, which is not the usual start for somebody who founds a, a tax advisory firm. And what happened was that I was, you know, I went through you know, three and a half years of, of engineering school at uh, one of the hardest colleges in the country. And then I went and interned for six months or five months, whatever it was, uh, that spring term of 2000. And I was working for AMD, uh, which is uh, Advanced Micro Devices. They're Intel's competitors. They make computer chips. And I happened to be there during the time when the first one gigahertz processor was was released for public and amd beat intel to the punch it was a huge deal with the uh in the company and you know everybody was super happy and they they handed out these um these gigabucks is what they call it. there's a little green like monopoly money kind of things and we could use them in the in the cafeteria and stuff like that so it was you know it was a big deal towards the end of my time there i was just an intern so i was there for the spring and uh towards the end of my time there there was a company-wide award ceremony and, uh, you know, so we all went into this amphitheater and, you know, they're giving out plaques, you know, uh, you know, Joe got three patents this year. Let's give him a hand. You know, everybody's clapping. Joe goes up, gets his, gets his plaque and sits down and, you know, they go through a bunch of these. This was all morning. And the last guy is the one I remember. I don't remember his name, but, uh, let's call him Bob. Cause I call everybody in my stories, Bob. And he got an award because he had a two week European vacation booked with his family, approved months in advance, paid for everything. And he canceled his trip in order to come in and work when the launch was going on. And everybody, it was like all hands on deck. And isn't he such a great company guy? So let's all give him a hand. <laughs> and it was at that moment that I realized I might have just wasted the last, you know, 20 years of my life. Because, <laughs> you know, all of this had been leading up to, you know, I got a, you know, I had a bachelor's in electrical engineering uh, with a specialization in bioengineering and, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I had, I had, there was a career trajectory associated with that. And I realized this whole corporate environment is not going to work for me because, <laughs> you know, if this is, if this is the thing that's rewarded, that's not going to be me. So uh, I realized early on, like it says here, the corporate world was not for me. So at that point, I started my entrepreneurial journey. I, I tried this and that, a bunch of different things. And, uh, you know, had ups and downs. And in 2007, so that was in 2000, 2007, I started getting letters from the IRS. And the first letter said, you owe, you know, $1.3 million in taxes. And that's <laughs> just, I remember, I remember opening this, this letter, because it's from the IRS, you know, it seems important. And I opened the letter and I read it. And I just remember thinking that there's just no way. It's just not possible. Well, it's not possible that I'm going to be able to pay it. And it's not possible that this is right. So I just chucked it and I ignored it. So if you ignore stuff from the IRS, here's what happens. First, you get letters and they send you more letters and then they send you more letters and then they start sending certified mail letters. And then if you ignore all those, you might get some phone calls. I had a phone call from a revenue agent named Joyce 
And, you know, I told her that this is wrong and she's, I don't remember what she said, but uh, I was trying to make my case and that's not the person you would make your case to. That's not how it works. And eventually they started garnishing my paycheck. So I was working for a place at the time and, you know, HR got a, a notice from the IRS saying you have to garnish this employee's wages. I had to sign a thing. And basically at that point I had no more income because they took everything except for like 300 bucks uh, every pay period. And so I was making $600 a month, which was uh, even at the time, even though, you know, $600 back then is worth more than $600 today. It wasn't that different. <laughs> so <laughs> it became an, a problem, you know, urgently. So at that point I started trying to fix my problem. So this whole process took like three, four years. And the, uh, so I went about trying to figure out who could help me solve this problem. So I ended up hooking up with this former wall street tax attorney and he helped me solve my problem. And it took about a year. And by the end of it, I owed $0 of that $1.3 million. Now the money they garnished, I did not get back because of past statute limitations, but, uh, the, you know, the balance was, uh, was waived basically. So that was, that worked out for me. And, you know, it just so happened that this, this, uh, wall street tax guy that I hooked up with, his business was starting to grow and he was fantastic at tax was terrible at running business. So I took my, at this point, past decade of, of entrepreneur learnings, you know, with successes and failures. And I started implementing this in his business. And so we grew his business. We tripled it over the next couple of years. And he taught me the, the wall street tax world. And, uh, that's really how I got into this whole thing. So, you know, my, my whole, my whole background is all about, you know, the, the independent person, the entrepreneur and learning, not just, you know, this number goes in this box on a tax form, but it's like, what can we do? How can we structure things? How can we apply, you know, big business principles that are used on wall street that are used in, in, you know, high tech, uh, and high finance kind of places and bring them down to the individual you and me level. So over the years uh, of, of that whole process, you know, I've done 50,000 tax returns, you know, billions of dollars worth of revenue and, you know, saving clients millions of dollars a year. So what became my mission was to help my tribe. And, and that tribe is the people like me who can't hold a job because <laughs> it's just not, not emotionally possible. Uh, so if you're a solopreneur or a small business owner or an independent contractor, my goal is for you to get your quality of life back. And, but quality of life, what I mean is that when you pay taxes, you t let's just say the federal government, uh, you know, the state governments, local governments, everything, but let's just say the feds, when you're paying taxes, you are going to work for the, for whatever percentage of the year you're going to work for them. So if you pay a tax rate of 30%, just overall, let's say, then you're working you know, 30% of the year for the government. And I think, well, one, that's probably not doing the world any favors. Uh, two, I think that it's damaging to your own life. And so my goal is to help my tribe, those solopreneurs and those independent contractors and those small business owners get as much of their life back as possible. Now we got to do it, you know, legitimately and ethically and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, I had a call this morning with somebody who says, yes, this is a tax deduction. Some people do it this way, but we want to do it you know, legitimately. So here's what we have to do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to follow all the rules, but the rules are written there to take advantage of, you know, the, the whole, the whole tax code is a series of carrots and sticks. It's Congress trying to do social engineering with financial incentives. That's what taxes are. So, uh, you know, there's the tax rates, the, they publish these tables. So okay, if you're head of household and you make this uh, between this much and that much, your tax is this, that's the first 30 pages of the U S master tax guide. The remaining like 800 pages of the, of the tax guide is these big books that they publish every year. Um, the remainder of that is all the exceptions, right? All the definitions, all the, all the things that apply in this case, not in that case and all that sort of stuff. And that's what we use in order to reduce people's tax bills dramatically. So. That is the story. That is what we do. And uh, let's get into a little bit extra here. Let's go to Tony Robbins has a great quote. Uh, the quality of our questions determines the quality of our life. I think that is 100% true. Uh, you know, if we don't ask the right things, then we're not going to get the right answers. So I actually have been wondering about taxes and hidden taxes lately. So this is going to be a little bit of an aside, but it'll, it'll hopefully make sense by the end of it. So capital gains tax is a, is a tax you pay when you 
buy, when you sell a, a capital asset, usually when we talk about capital gains tax, we're talking about stocks. Could be bonds, could be other things, but generally stocks. So let's say you bought, I don't know, let's let's pick a stock. Uh, Serena, what's, what's your favorite stock? Do you have one? Um, <laughs> right now, uh, Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. Okay. Tesla is definitely the thing that people look okay. at <laughs> one of the most. We've had a lot of people make a lot of money in Tesla. So it's a, it's a darling. Let's bring up the chart here. And chart. You can tell I've been doing stock stuff a long time because I use Yahoo Finance. That's mm -hmm. when I was, <laughs> I was day trading back in like 2003 it was all in Yahoo Finance. It was a whole thing. But uh, okay, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a, a one-year chart. So let's let's look. Let's extend this out. Tesla's not that old. Okay, so let's say you bought Tesla back here uh, in 2020, uh, which is not that long ago. 138 bucks, and let's say you sold it today for 199. So 138 to 199, right? Mm -hmm. Let's bring up the calculator here. And let's do 199 minus 138, and that gives us a profit of $61. Okay, so we got $61 of gains. Now, depending on how much income you have overall for the year, your capital gains rate is going to be 0, 15, or 20%. And then if your income is high enough, you might also have a net investment income tax of an additional 3.8%. So the people who have large paydays, you know, they're going to be paying 24% to the feds. And then the state's going to be whatever the state's going to be, depending on where they're living. So, uh, but let's just go with 20%. Okay, so $61, $61 a share times 20% is $12.2. So of the 61, you're paying 12 in taxes. So you bought at 138, you sold at 199, you capture the spread, you pay tax of 12. That leaves you with uh, whatever 61 minus 12.2 is. And that's, that leaves you with 48, dollars per share of actual take home profit. But is that actually profit? That was, that was what I was thinking about. So what I did was I went to the, uh, BLS, uh, CPI. There we go. So BLS is the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they keep the consumer price index because, you know, when you sell a capital asset, like a stock, you know, Sure, you might buy some more and buy, buy some other stocks, then you sell those and you buy some other stuff. But eventually, the point of the whole thing is to be able to use that money for your life, right? So you're going to buy a trip, you're going to buy a car, you're going to have money going towards your house, you're going to be buying food, whatever it is. That's all going into your, into your lifestyle eventually. So uh, if we look at the CPI, we which is, you know, there's there's debates people have about CPI as far as how valid it is. But if we look at uh, January of 2020 to January of 2024, what did we say it was? 130 something? Mm -hmm. uh, 138? We've had some inflation over the last couple of years. So $138 in January of 2020 is actually $165 today, $164.99. So now wait a second. We sold the thing for 199, right? That's the price right now. So 199. And we spent spent, quote unquote, in hidden inflation tax, you know, whatever from 138 to 165. Okay? So 165 minus 138 is $27. So $27 of your gain is actually not your gain because you're just staying in place because of inflation. So the, so we have $27 in inflation, we have $12 in actual tax, and so the, the combination of those is $39, or 39.2. So now, we didn't make 48.8, really. We made 61 minus 39.2. So we made $21 after we factor into the fact that we lost purchasing power through inflation. So, how much tax did you actually pay? Well, you know, if we look at the, I mean, it depends on what you compare it to, right? So if you look at, compare it to the 138, well, you paid, uh, let's see, 39.2 divided by 138, 
you paid a 28% tax on that. If you compare it to the sale, it's going to be a lower percentage. Uh, so 38.8 divided by 199, it's going to be a 20% tax there. But that's just straight off the top. That's not on the gain. On the actual gain, you paid 63.6% in tax, whether it's the hidden inflation tax or the or the non-hidden capital gains tax. So that is a huge amount. And, you know, I'm, I remember that during the Trump administration, when they were doing all their tax stuff, there was a proposal to inflation adjust capital gains, and it never went anywhere. Uh, but it would it would dramatically change things. Because in this case, so if we had gone from 138 to 199 or 165 to 99, so 165 is $34 of of real terms profit, so not not nominal, but real in terms of inflation adjusted, then your tax would have dropped to 6.8 from 12.2. And that is, that's a huge difference. <laughs> so, so I've been playing around with the idea of building a calculator that people can actually do this, where it'll, you know, you put in your stock purchase and you put in your stock sale and the dates, and then it'll calculate, okay, well, your inflation adjusted amount is this, and then you're actually paying this on the nominal amount. And the total tax rate is going to be, you know, whatever it's going to be, but it's way, way higher than, than the 20% or 23.8 or the 15 or the 18.8, whatever it is that you're actually into paying, you know, plus your state, right? We didn't even factor that in here. So, you know, if you live in a place like California, you might be paying 75% in tax between inflation and capital gains and state, uh, which is just crazy. And it's, you know, at, at, you know, it's getting, to, that gets to the point of like, you know, why bother? Right. <laughs> so. And that's not even that long, right? That's four years. And, you know, we've had a high inflation in four years. But, um, you know, if you go back and you you were an early buyer and you're down here, you know, the, the inflation just eats up more and more. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of wild when you start stopping thinking about that. But that's so these are some of the questions that, that I think about from time to time as I, you know, look at different things and think about taxes and people's situations. So back to the point here, quality of our questions determines the quality of our life. And, you know, knowing that, you know, that, uh, inflation, uh, impact on the total tax load. And, and I call this, you know, I call it inflation a tax because it comes fundamentally from, uh, from deficit spending by the government. So it's spending by the government. It impacts your purchasing power. Therefore it's a tax to me, although that's not the technical definition. But that's just how I phrase it. So, but, you know, knowing that allows us to make more informed decisions as far as what do we want to do? How do we want to deploy capital? All those kinds of things. So uh, let's go into the next part. Uh, so my question is, you know, what is the root problem with overpaying on your taxes? So, you know, I addressed this a little bit earlier, but basically, you know, if you're wasting 20% of your life, that's 74 days a year. And by wasting, you know, I'm maybe I'm hyperbolic, I don't know. But what when you are overpaying on your taxes beyond what you need to, uh, you know, that's required by law, then I consider that a waste. You are voluntarily working for the government for no benefit, no direct benefit at the very least. I mean, people could argue about indirect benefit of, you know, well, who will build the roads and all that kind of stuff. But uh definitely no direct benefit. So you know, what, what could you do in those 74 days? You know, could you grow your business more? Could you go on a vacation? Could you spend more time with your kids? All the different things that you could do in those 74 days you can't do because, you know, you're stuck, you're stuck working for the government because you're not taking advantage of all the things that you could. And 74 days is, is the 20% of a, of a year. That's, that's where that number comes from. And that's 20% is a pretty reasonable number uh, as far as, you know, people, people come to us, they're paying 35% in tax when you average out everything and we reduce them down to 15%. That's a very common situation. So, um, you know, it's, it's a reasonable number. Obviously everybody's situation is going to be different. Everybody's facts and circumstances are different. And, uh, but as far as broad averages, 20% is a pretty good number to use. Maybe it's 15, maybe it's 22, maybe it's 17.3, you know, whatever, but, uh, in that ballpark. So two months, two months of your life that you're spending working for the government when you probably don't need to. So that's my question. And that's my, that's my answer. The, the real root problem is that 
is that time that you never get back. Because, you know, money comes and goes. Uh, hopefully it comes more than it goes. But, you know, we go through seasons of life. I think most people experience that. And, you know, the only thing we have, the only thing that we can never get back is that time. So uh, that it has become, as I've gotten older, that's become more and more important to me. And, you know, if you're a young person listening to this and you're 23 and, you know, you're maybe you're just out of school or, you know, you're starting your, your, uh, your adult life, let's say, then, you know, that's something to, something to keep in mind. It's, it's hard for young people. I mean, I was there, I didn't care. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'm not sure it's a lesson that can be learned early, but if you can, great. Uh, so hopefully any, any newbies to the adult world of business and finance and tax will be able to take that to heart and, and avoid, uh, lots of, lots of, uh, wasted time here. All right. But that's not what you came for. Came for the answer to all tax questions. Drum roll, answer, please. <laughs> answer all tax questions. Is it depends. Yeah. And, you know, accountants and lawyers always say it depends because it's true. <laughs> it does depend. It depends on facts and circumstances. And my favorite example is $100 shows up in your bank account. What is that? And this is going to be a problem starting next year. It was supposed to start last year, but then the IRS kicked the can down the road twice. So... $100 shows up in your bank account. Do you owe taxes on that? Is it income? Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's reimbursement. Maybe it's your buddy paying you back for dinner. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, it all depends on what the facts and circumstances surrounding that transaction are. So uh, the the issue that's going to come up for a lot of people is the, the new 1099K rules. And this was from, I think it was the CARES Act. Uh, I can't remember at this point, but basically... Payment processors, which includes credit cards like American Express, Visa, MasterCard, all those guys, also includes things like PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, that kind of stuff. Also includes uh, things like Airbnb and uh, Venmo, uh, or not Venmo, uh, VRBO. Venmo is also one, actually. Um, so all of these are are coordinating payments from one party to another party. So they're third party payment providers, and they issue a form called a 1099K. Now, the 1099K lists out how many transactions there were, what the total dollar volume of those transactions were, and then it breaks it out by dollar volume per month. So that's how the form works. You only get the form and the company only files the form if, under current rules, you have total of more than $20,000 of transactions and more than 200 transactions for the year. So you have to satisfy both of those in order for one of those forms to be generated. So if you have a business and you are you're use PayPal as your payment channel, then you've probably gotten one of these 1099Ks. But if you are, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing, I don't know, uh, like, so my, my kids, Girl Scouts uh, troop, they use 1099 or they use Venmo to send money back and forth a lot. Uh, cause you know, it's cookie, we're just wrapping up cookie season. So, you know, there was a whole thing with, with the cookie booth sales over this past weekend. And some of the people paid with Venmo. Okay, great. So um, the new rules, which were, like I said, supposed to go into effect last year, the IRS said, well, we can't implement it. So we're going to, we're going to delay another year. And then they're delayed again uh, this year or 2023. And so theoretically for 2024, they're saying this time we mean it. But the new rules, instead of $20,000 and 200 transactions, the new rule is going to be, if you have at least $600 worth of total transaction volume, any number of transactions, then you're going to get one of these forms. So if somebody sends you $600, you're going to get a 1099K. If if 10 people send you 60, you're going to get a 1099K. And the problem with this is that so many people use these payment channels for non-income related things. So like I said, if you're reimbursing somebody for dinner or, you know, the you know, the Girl Scouts, so, you know, it went into one account and we got to shift it over to this other account in order to, you know, put it in the right place. You know, all, all these kinds of things uh, or gifts, you know, so somebody sends, you know, $10 on cash app to, to somebody else just as a, here, you need some money. Here you go. Maybe it's a loan, you know, all these things. There is no way to distinguish that on the form, you know, so we're going to have to have some mechanism in order to dis, uh, disaggregate the, the funds as far as like how much is actually income, how much is you know, non-income stuff, you know, loans and gifts and reimbursements and all this kind of stuff. And it's just going to be a nightmare. <laughs> so, so it depends. And, you know, 
these are just this this is a very basic level where it depends and it's going to affect millions of people they're expecting 30 million of these 1099k forms to be filed under this new rule and uh, the implementation of that 30 million forms has been the cause of this delay for two years but um, theoretically eventually they will get around to to building the system um you know and it's it's just gonna be it's just gonna be a lot to deal with so you know that that idea though of it depends translates to everything in the tax world so that's just that's just the reality of it and that's why accountants and lawyers and things like this always say well you know when you ask a broad question it depends <laughs> yep all right but uh you know with that with that said uh Sarita, do we have any questions on tap as far as things that have come in over the last little while uh well one of them was the new tax laws what are they <laughs> what are they uh <laughs> well there's there's a bunch uh let's see the well the the current new tax law that is that is in congress right now is the uh is the i'm trying to remember the full title it's the relief for american workers and and research uh or innovation something or other you know congress comes up with these crazy long titles but basically the the new the new legislation that's in congress right now is trying to fix a couple problems so one th one problem that's trying to fix is uh, there are some issues with people who are dual nationals between Taiwan and the U.S. Okay, so that's not that many people. Um, another issue that they're trying to fix is the child tax credit, and they're changing how the you know the child tax credit is uh, up to two thousand dollars per child, up to five kids, and it's for ki children between zero and uh, uh, zero and sixteen, and then. What they're doing is they are going to be adjusting the total amount uh, at to go up over the years, as opposed to just being a flat rate, you know, for however long. And they are also adjusting how much of it is refundable versus non-refundable. So the difference between non-refundable credits and refundable credits, non-refundable means that it only gets deducted against the tax that you actually owe. So if you have a tax bill where your total tax is $10,000, you could have up to $10,000 of non-refundable tax credits and your tax bill will go to zero. But if you owe, uh, let's say $5,000 and you have a $7,500 tax credit, that a non-refundable tax credit, then you only get $5,000 because that was your total, right? So uh, people are running, starting to run into that with the new uh, electric vehicle credit because of the way they've refigured that. Um, and then refundable credits means even if you don't owe any tax, you still get cash back from the government. So the earned income credit is the largest um, in terms of total dollar amount um, refundable tax credit. The child tax credit is an, has a refundable portion, and there and this legislation is altering that uh, that amount. And so that that's that's another set of issues. And then a third set of issues that this legislation is trying to fix is the R and D uh, tax credit. So uh, under some under the Trump legislation, there was a rule change in 2023 or 2022 um where if you are uh, deducting or if you have research and development um expenditure so you get a credit for it and you know numbers vary but credit usually comes out to about six percent so uh if you have a company where you're doing software development let's say then the the credit comes out to six percent but you don't get to deduct the amount you spent on the on, you know, usually it's people, you know, coders and stuff like that. Uh, you know, different companies, different businesses will have different uh, mixes of, you know, the different factors that go into R&D, but labor is usually a big part of it. So, you, you know, you paid a guy, let's say $100,000 of salary, and you don't get to deduct $100,000. You can only deduct $10,000, and then the remainder spreads out over five years. So what we ran into with this rule change is that the 10% deduction plus the 6% credit does not make up for the tax that you have to pay on picking up the other 90%. So you actually end up in the hole uh, with the R&D credit. And so what the uh, what the legislation has in it is that they are going to, um, they're going to push off that rule change for another couple of years and they're going to make it retroactive for 2022 filings where people had to do this and they'll be able to uh, make elections to uh, treat it the other way. And then... Um, that'll be a huge, 
uh, saving grace for, for companies that have R and D expenses. So we had a couple clients last year that had, you know, large tax bills because of this rule change. And, you know, we we're just kind of, uh, stuck. I mean, we did all, all the other things that we could do, but still it's, you know, when, when that's such a big part of your, of your expense and you can't deduct it and you have to, you have to push it out over the next five years, it just creates problems. So, uh, so that's the third part of the legislation. And then a fourth part of the legislation is bonus depreciation. So bonus depreciation has come and gone throughout the uh, throughout the years in the tax code. So let's say you buy a desk, okay? So desks are office furniture, you know, or FF and E, you know, fixtures, furniture, and equipment. And typically, these have a seven year schedule, meaning that you they the the IRS expects that a desk will last on average seven years, and you deduct one seventh of the expense, you know, each year. And that's, that's called, um, and well, so that, that amortizes and you take the depreciation each year. So if you had a $700 desk, you take a hundred dollars first year, hundred dollars second year, hundred dollars third year, on through the seventh year. And then by the end it's zero and you know, you throw it out, uh, if, or if you sell it, you know, that sale is actually a gain because you've depreciated the whole thing down to zero bonus depreciation alters, alters those rules. And like I said, the rules around bonus have changed many times over the years. So under the Trump tax reform, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act 2017, the most most things got 100% bonus treatment. And so that means if you bought a desk, you got a $700 write-off in the year you bought it. You don't have to wait seven years to write off the full thing. So it became, it, it transitioned a lot of things on a tax basis from uh, an amortized over years to a current cash expense, pretty much. And then part of the finagling that they did when they passed this law, it was that there was a phase out and 2023 was the beginning of the phase out. So in 2023, instead of getting hundred percent bonus depreciation, you get 80 and then it goes down to 60 and then it goes down to 40 and then it, it all what goes away in 2026. So they are in this legislation, they are proposing to push off the, uh, the phase out portion and keep everything back at hundred percent through 2026. And this is part of the problem with whenever you have, uh, you know, sunsets is what they call it in, in tax law is that, you know, the sunset in that future year, I mean, they do that so that when the CBO, the congressional budget office scores, you know, legislation, they say, Oh, well, the total cost over the next 10 years is going to be whatever, you know, they play these games in order to, in order to make that report come out better for whatever their purpose is. And, uh, but in those future years, Congress can just pass a new law and the whole thing changes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, it, uh, that law, that legislation has already passed the house. It is in the Senate and, uh, well, you know, let's, let's take a look. Uh, I think it's HR 7024. That's the one. Hey, let's see what's happening on it lately. It's been a couple days since I've looked. Let's see, tax relief for, uh, tax relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. So, okay, nothing's changed since the beginning of February. Uh, you know, this was a big announcement out of the Senate when they reached this negotiation. So, uh, you know, it's still expecting to pass, but, uh, we're still waiting on the Senate and then obviously the president will have to sign it or the, if he vetoes, they got to overcome, you know, with the, what is it? Two thirds majority. I try to remember my ninth grade, uh, American history stuff, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's the current big thing because otherwise the, the law changes, oh, we're starting to get into the sunset phase of the tax gun jobs act. Um, because, so we're, we're losing 20% depreciation per year of bonus depreciation. Um, the, uh, the craziness with the R and D credit is one of those effects. The, uh, the qualified business income deduction, you know, we'll be getting, it's not a phase out there, but it's a, it's a cliff where it just ends. Um, qualified opportunity zones. If people are into the real estate stuff, uh, as far as deferring capital gains, those are, those are all on the chopping block, uh, with the phase out of the tax cut and jobs act. Uh, one thing that people will be excited to have phase out is the salt cap. So salt is, is state and local taxes. So under the old rules before 2017, you could deduct however much you paid in in local and state income tax and your uh, uh, real estate tax for your personal residence. Those went on your itemized deductions. 
and it was unlimited. So if you had, if you were a high earner in New Jersey and you made three hundred thousand dollars, you might be paying you know fifty grand in New Jersey taxes, and so that was a deduction against your federal income. And under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, that was limited uh, to ten thousand dollars, and so a lot of high earners were really hurt by this change. And you know, wouldn't you know it? Those were all in Democrat states. So you know, it was a it was a really <laughs> really calculated move by the by the Republicans back then in order to penalize their political opponents. Uh, so you know, people who are in who are high earners in high tax states. Uh, which are, you know, your New York's, New, New, New Jersey's, California's, uh, Oregon, you know, all, all Democrat strongholds. Uh, they are, they've been penalized by this rule and that, that rule will expire here in a couple of years at this point. Uh, but uh, they have been lobbying their Democrat uh, Congress people in order to uh, remove that cap over the years. And it's never gone anywhere because Democrats have a political problem with it in that, well, if we do this, then we're seeing the same as the Republicans of just rewarding the rich people because these are people earning, you know, hundreds of thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, typically. So um, that is a whole thing. <laughs> and some states have created, created workarounds with this called the uh, pass through entity tax, where if you have a pass through entity and you have income tax personally attributable to the pass through entity, then the pass-through entity can pay the tax on your behalf and then it becomes a corporate deduction, not a personal deduction. And the IRS has actually okayed this. So, you know, it's a whole tit for tat thing that goes on back and forth between, uh, between different parties in the tax world. Uh, but yeah, so that's some of the legislation that's, that's going on. Uh, you know, there's always, there's always little things depending on, you know, very niche, um, uh, cases of, you know, particular industries and things, but those are, those are kind of the broad strokes that apply to a lot of people. Okay. So <laughs> I have uh, more questions from clients. Uh, so, uh, they want to know about the side business. Uh, mm. so they have the side gig or a freelance income coming in. They want to yep. know how does it impact their taxes? That is a good question. Um, <laughs> So, it, well, I was going to say it depends. Yeah, it does depend. <laughs> it does depend. So, you know, most businesses, especially early businesses that you're starting up on a part-time basis, you know, don't make any money. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So one is you're still figuring out what it is you're doing. Uh, you might be investing in training and all kinds of things, you know, getting the business up and going, advertising, all this sort of stuff. And so... Uh, most of those businesses will actually run at a loss if you do your accounting properly. A lot of, one of the traps of a side business is you're not giving it your full full attention. It's by definition, it's part-time. So you might not be keeping your records very well. Uh, so that's that's thing number one to, to fix. Um, but as far as how it, how it impacts you, so it depends on lots of things. Uh, one of the things it depends on is your entity structure. So if you are just operating you know, as a DBA uh, or a sole proprietorship, then that goes on what's called a Schedule C. It just, it's a it's a little mini um, profit and loss statement, basically. And that gets included on Schedule C. That gets attached to your 1040. So it gets filed along with your personal individual tax return. If you have a single member LLC that is disregarded, that also files on a Schedule C. And so there are... Um, the, the advantage of doing it that way is that it's easier. <laughs> That's the only advantage, but it is easier because it's, you know, less forms and less, less formalities and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, it has its, it has its revenue, it has its expenses. And then at the bottom it has, you know, net profit or net loss on a schedule C. If you have net profit, you have income tax due on that net profit and you have self-employment tax on the full amount of that net profit. Now, how much self-employment tax could be 15.3%. If you have a lot of wages elsewhere, it might be less because uh, Social Security has a cap, which is the majority of the self-employment tax, 12.9 of the 15.3 is, is Social Security. And the other um, uh, 3.4 is um, uh, Medicare tax. So Medicare has no cap. You'll pay Medicare on all earnings, on all um, uh, um, active earnings, basically. And, but, but social security does have a, does have a limit. It was 160, uh, or 161,000 this past year. So if you have a profit, then 
that is going to impact you uh, that way. So uh, if let's say you're in the 32% bracket or, uh, and then you have, uh, you, so you're going to have 32% on that extra income because marginal rates are always on the next dollar. And so you have 32% there, you got 15.3% on the, uh, on the self-employment. So your total federal tax in that scenario would be, uh, whatever 32 plus 15 is, was that 47%? So that's a lot. Plus your state tax, you know, it might be, you know, if you live in a high tax place, you know, like California, California can get up to 13%. So, I mean, you might be at 60 by that point. So that, that is, that is one potential impact. If you have a loss, then you're going to have a subtraction of tax. Now you don't get to subtract your, your, um, your payroll tax. So if you have a W2 over here and a uh, self-employment loss over there, you don't, they don't net that out. You don't get your social security and your Medicare back. What it does do is it will lower your overall earnings when it comes time to calculate your social security benefit when you retire. So you got to watch out for that. I've had clients come in, uh, you know, near in, in retirement phase and they said, you know, like, oh, my monthly benefit is lower than I thought it would be. And then we say, okay, well, let's look at your employment records. Like, oh, in 2008 through 2010, you reported zero earnings. And the guy said, well, I have a job though, or I had a job back then. So I should have had something. So we found his tax returns. Uh, we didn't file them. This was before uh, he had been a client. And uh, it turns out that he had taken this crazy schedule C loss. So he had like uh, $80,000 of W-2 and he had a hundred thousand loss on his schedule C. So that netted out to zero. It actually netted out to minus 20, but they cap it at zero for social security purposes. And so, yeah, so he got no credit during those years uh, and he didn't even know that until, you know, 10 years later. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that is something to, to be aware of. Um, you know, I don't recommend anybody rely on social security as far as, uh, as far as, uh, living on, you know, in, in retirement, but you know, a lot of people do end up there. So, um, so if you're, if you have a net loss, you don't get the 15.3% back, but you do get the marginal rate back. So, uh, let's say you have, uh, a, Ten thousand dollar loss, and you're in that same thirty two percent bracket. You're going to get thirty two hundred bucks worth of tax savings out of that. So that's scenario one, though, or scenario one and two, if you're filing Schedule C. So Schedule Cs are one of the reddest of red flags out there, and I've got a whole thing on why that is. But basically, the IRS does analysis on what they call the tax gap, and you can look up the IRS publication. I want to say it's nine sixteen. I don't know. I'd have to look it up, but, um, there's a tax gap and what they do is they take a three year period, usually it's three years. And they say, okay, we think we should have been paid by the American taxpayers X number of dollars. We only received a smaller amount. So the difference is the gap. And the last gap that they had was $400 billion over a three year period. So when they look at what are the different categories that are responsible for this shortcoming, they, they break it out and there's a report. Uh, and the largest single category that accounts for 30% of the bracket of the, of the gap, rather 30% of the missing money, as far as the IRS is concerned is in individual income tax, business income. And that means schedule C's. So, uh, you know, the IRS is hiring all these agents right now. And if you're, uh, if you're a revenue agent and your job is to go after missing money, you're going to go where the missing money is, which is schedule C's. So, you know, that is, uh, that is a definite downside to filing Schedule C's. I am not a fan of Schedule C's, uh, just because of the audit risk. Um, and the, then we have the self-employment issues. So how can you do it better? Uh, well, that same side business, you can incorporate it. If you have an LLC or a corporation or what have you, you can elect different treatments. Uh, so if it's corporation, it has to file a separate tax return, but most people these days just use LLCs because they're simpler and easier. So an LLC for federal tax purpose does not exist. Uh, they call it creature of the state. And what that means is you have to tell the IRS how you want it to be treated for tax purposes. An LLC can be a disregarded entity filing a Schedule C on a personal tax return. It can be a partnership filing a 1065 tax return. It can be a corporation filing an 1120 tax return. It can be an S corporation filing 1120S uh, tax return. And there's different rules as far as like who can own it and all that kind of stuff for, for those different things. But if it's a if it's a side business, typically the best thing to do is going to be have it be have it elect to be an S corporation, and then 
there's it probably goes beyond the scope of what we want to get into right now because we're already 45 minutes in unbelievably uh but uh in an s corporation it files its own tax return and then just like on a schedule c you know the it has revenue and it has expenses and then at the bottom it has a net profit or net loss the net profit or net loss flows through to your personal tax return so the 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 company creates a form when it files a tax return called a k1 and that K-1 gets included in your personal tax return, and it goes on Schedule E-2, if you really want to know. And that income or that that income or that loss gets included with all your other income and loss, subject to various rules. So if you have a if you have a gain, same thing. If you have a ten thousand dollar gain from your from your S Corp, you're gonna have ten thousand dollars worth of extra income. And if you're in the 32 percent bracket, you're gonna have thirty two hundred dollars worth of extra income tax. Uh, I'm gonna gloss over qualified business income deductions for the moment. So what's critical though, is that that 10,000 does not carry self-employment tax like a Schedule C does. So you don't have that extra 15.3%, which is, you know, a big deal. That's, you know, a, a third of that tax from the Schedule C was that self-employment tax in that scenario. So, you know, that's a, that's a savings right there. Now there are rules around that as far as, you know, how much you can take there and, and the whys and wherefores. Uh, and then if you have a loss, you have the same the same kind of loss as in a Schedule C, but with a 10 times lower audit risk. So for that reason alone, I often prefer doing uh, uh, S-corporations for side businesses. So when you have a side business, you know, you're, you're probably losing money. Just that's the reality of it uh, because of you know, all the issues with startup and, and everything. And if you're making money, then it tends to become not a side business, right? It tends to become a full-time business. So, um, so, you know, you, you want to do your accounting, right? Make sure you're documenting all the expenses that you can. And we have a bunch of strategies that go into that, uh, which you can see on some of our other webinars, as far as our, our four-step method there, uh, to, to capture all those, uh, extra expenses that, you know, you should attribute to your business. And if you end up with a net loss, then that will subtract from your day job income. So, you have line one W two income, uh, you know, pick a number, eighty thousand dollars. What I said earlier, and let's say you lost fifteen thousand uh, uh, dollars through your side business, and you have to have basis, which means that you have enough investment into the company in order to justify taking those expenses. Because if you just get like debt financing inside the company, then that doesn't quite qualify. Uh, but that's that's an unusual situation for a side business. Uh, but by and large, you're funding the thing with cash and you have to demonstrate that you got to, you got to follow the rules as far as, you know, uh, d as far as building, you know, the basis in the, in the, in the company. And then, you know, you have your, you have your tax loss. And so that subtracts from your day job income. So instead of 80, you're now on a tax basis making 65. Uh, and then your, your tax is, is assessed at that 65 starting number. And you have your standard deduction and, you know, credits for kids and, you know, whatever else you have going on in your life. But um, that's kind of the the basics of, <laughs> of how side businesses impact your your regular taxes. Uh, so it, it can get complicated, uh, but the the number one rule is you got to have your numbers. You got to do your, you know, your revenue and your expenses and be able to document all these things because that's what everything comes down to is, you know, documentation. Um, you know, if, and when the, uh, the IRS comes asking about stuff, 99% of the time they're saying, Hey, you said this on your tax return. Uh, if you just show us your records of that and 70% of those letters just get no response. And I was one of those 70%. So I understand, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I want to save people from making the same mistake that I did. Uh, so if, you know, have, have your numbers, do your bookkeeping. Uh, I recommend, hiring out outsiders. I mean, we do bookkeeping, but you don't even have to hire us. You have to just hire somebody, um, to do your books and, uh, you know, keep you, uh, up to date and accurate as far as your filings go. Okay. So we have another question. I think this is probably going to be the last question. Yeah, right? I think so. <laughs> Okay. Um, so a client wanted to know that they heard about the Augusta rule and they uh -huh. also know about the home office deduction. Right. They want to know if they can use both of them at the same time on their tax return. Not the same time, same place. No, you can't double dip. 
but you can, if, you, if you're strategic about it, you can exclude one from the other. And so you take a lesser on, on one side in order to gain the other side. Because, you know, ideally you want both, uh, but you just have to carve that out so that you're not overlapping. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into the math of that. <laughs> right now we've done enough math already uh, this time around. But uh, yeah, the, the short answer is don't double dip. Uh, do do things in a way that uh, that you are not double dipping, basically. Wow, that, so that, that was the, that was a record like, short one. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, so another. Let's do one uh, more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how uh, another question is how do uh, how does capital gains and losses from investments affect my tax liability? Ah. So it's heads I win, tails you lose, basically. So so capital. So if you have a gain, then it goes into so there's there's two different categories. There's short term and long term. Short term means you owned the thing for less than a year and then you sold it and whatever that gain is you're going to pay your ordinary rates at so it gets you know all your income gets totaled up they put you into a bracket if you're in the 32 percent bracket like we were talking about then you're going to pay 32 percent tax on that short-term gain uh so long-term gains are things that are held more than a year and you get you get preferred rates on the long-term gains of either 0 15 or 20 percent and uh, there may be an extra, you know, net investment income tax. I call these Obamacare taxes because they were created uh, when Obamacare was created in order to fund, you know, Obamacare stuff. So um, basically you can pay anywhere from zero to 23.8% federally on long-term capital gains tax. Um, and it gets, you know, so it adds to your AGI, but it has uh, AGI being adjusted gross income. So it adds to your total income for the for the year, but the amount of tax assessed for that portion is lower than your uh, your regular day job income or other kinds of income. So that is done intentionally in order to encourage people to invest for long term growth. And the the long term capital gains rate, whether you're zero, fifteen, or twenty, is always going to be lower than your ordinary rate. That's just that's just the way they set it up. So um, if you have $100,000 worth of short-term and $100,000 worth of long-term, the $100,000 of long-term is always going to be less taxed than the $100,000 of short-term. So that is if you have gains. If you have losses, um, they're not real fans. <laughs> so <laughs> so there, there's a loss limitation of $3,000. So let's say uh, we had a lot of people do this with, uh, with crypto over the last few years. They bought this, they bought that. And basically things cratered, you know, 95, 98% and it is, they sold, right? So that, if that loss was, let's pick a big number, $100,000, then you get to deduct $3,000 a year for the next 30 years or 33 years. And what happens is that loss will carry forward year after year after year until you use it all up or until you have other gains from those future years that will, that will eat up that loss. So, uh, I can, I can attest to this personally. I have a large capital loss that's been rolling forward on my tax return for decade and a half at this point. <laughs> so, uh, so it just goes $3,000 a year, um, every year. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that's what I mean by the heads I win, tails you lose. So if you have a gain, you got to pay tax on the full amount this year. If you have a loss, eh, it'll help a little bit depending on what else, what else you have going on. Um, but you, they don't they don't allow you to to take the reward if you want to call it that of that loss. So that that's capital loss. That's different than an ordinary loss. Uh, so those are two different categories. Um, and so there's when it comes to losses, there's different rules for different types of income. And so that's one of the that's one of the things with with um, uh, with uh, capital losses is, is that three thousand dollar limitation. So I've had people come to me and say, hey, you know, uh, yeah, I made a whole bunch of money at my day job this year, but I lost a hundred grand on taxes. So that'll help, right? I was like, eh, not really. <laughs> It'll help $3,000 worth. And so if you're, if your tax rate, again, it's going back to 32%, uh, $3,000 times 32% is 960 bucks. So that'll save you 960 bucks this year and probably 960 bucks next year and 960 bucks for the next 30 years. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's rough. So ideally, don't lose money, right? <laughs> that's that's Warren Buffett's rule number one. 
And rule number two is refer back to rule number one. But obviously, you know, losses do happen. And uh, the code or the tax law is written in such a way that they do not want to incentivize that. Um, so uh, whether it's fair or not, I will leave for you to decide. But that is the way the, the law is written. All right. So that is uh, this week's office hours. I think, well, we've got four questions in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know some of those went went kind of long, but um, you know this is you know when, when everything depends, this is kind of how it goes. We got to explain what it depends on. So hopefully that is helpful to people. And uh, in the last couple minutes, let's just go on to the next slide. Uh, basically, there are uh, two things to to think about. So one is you can go to taxrip.com slash live. Uh, if you go there right now, it'll point you back to this uh, call, uh, but after we get off the call, I'll update the link and we'll go to next week's call because we do these every Tuesday, 6 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern because I'm on the East Coast. And uh, the other thing, though, is that if you want to get our fill-in-the-blank tax templates that goes over all of our planning guidelines, well, not all of them, but our common ones, let's say that, and it has uh, video uh, video uh, lessons on, on how to do each one and a business base camp tax guide and an extra tax filing checklist to avoid red flags with the IRS, go ahead, go ahead and go to taxsherpa.com slash templates and you can get all that for seven bucks. Seven so bucks. Super, seven <laughs> bucks, super cheap. And uh, that will, that will give you access to, you know, your own, you make a copy and you'll have your own uh, tax planner for the year and you'll be able to input all different kinds of stuff. Uh, you'll have your meeting strategy. You'll have your reimbursement strategy. You'll have entity optimization uh, forms, uh, we'll have, we have a, uh, actually something I don't think I told you, Serena, I added, uh, yesterday or the day before was a profit first distribution calculator. So I'm a big fan of profit first where you segregate your, uh, your money into, into different accounts so that you know how much you have for spending and how much for, uh, how much you should take home, how much for profit, how much for, uh, tax savings. And, uh, you put in your numbers and it'll auto calculate the right percentages for everything to go to. Um, it'll have, uh, uh, in, in the monthly meetings, uh, section, it'll guide you through having yourself a monthly meeting and, you know, what to look at for, for your numbers, uh, you know, you know, revenues, uh, expenses, large expenses, uh, review your plans from last month, and last quarter, make plans for this upcoming month, this upcoming quarter, and all that kind of stuff. It's, you know, if you use these, these are really, really powerful. And, um, you know, if you want a full DIY kind of solution, that's your guide. Go to taxsherpa.com slash templates and you can, you can save yourself thousands of dollars uh, in taxes this year. So that about brings us to the end here. And um, any, any parting thoughts, uh, Serena? Uh, well, it just depends. <laughs> it just depends. Everything depends. That yeah. is correct. All right. So that's it for today. And we will see you next time. Uh, next time is the 5th, I believe. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So March 5th. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday, March 5th at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. And we'll do it all over again. Yep. All righty. Have a good one, everybody. All righty. Bye, guys. <laughs>